but now for an analysis of how much progress Nigeria has made, politically speaking, in the past 59 years. We are now being joined by Senator Shewu Sani, who is in our Abuja studio, and Odia Ofemo, who is with us here in our Lagos uh, studio. Odia Ofemo, welcome to the morning show. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Senator Sani is there in Abuja. He will join us shortly. But Odia Ofemo, let's start with you. Uh, before we uh, took another look at that uh, speech by President Buhari, um, I'd asked you uh, what your reaction is about the journey that we have had from uh, independence uh, to date, looking back and, you know, looking at the present and perhaps the future. Well, it is not always a, a great help to begin Nigeria's story from Independence Day, because much of what happened after independence, we are preceded by events that marked Nigeria so... If you pause just a minute, let me welcome uh, Senator Shiru Sani, who is already uh, also with us in Abuja. Senator Sani, good morning. Good to have you on the uh, morning show. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank, Thank you, Thank you very me. much. Yes, I'd ask uh, Odia Ofemo, who is also with us in the studio here in Lagos, uh, to comment on Nigeria's journey from uh, independence uh, to the moment and then uh, make certain observations. I will come back to you shortly. Odia Ofemo. Yeah, I, I was saying it is, not, it is not quite a great help when we start from Independence Day because many of the ev events that preceded 1960 literally overdetermined what happened thereafter. I mean, we should always remember that the first time Nigerians met together to discuss how to run their country was 1950. And when we are talking about Nigeria's history, we always tend to forget that Nigeria, the British had been here from about 1900, but Nigerians never met formally to determine a way of running their country until 1950. So that sometimes when we talk about how far Nigeria has progressed, I think it would also be fair to talk about how far we could not progress because of the manner in which we came together. If you start from 1950 as, as when Nigeria actually started managing Nigerian affairs, by the time you got to 1960, you already have a formalized way of doing things. And 1960 was a particularly interesting year because the election that, that brought Nigerians into power had laid a table, so to say, which which was, as I said, overdetermined by what had happened between 1950 and that date. That was the year, 1960, when Nigerians decided to apply the decisions they had taken between that 50 and 59. And we did not take the best decisions. I mean, there were three regions in the country, and there were three big political parties. There were other political parties. But we had a very peculiar situation where every region was dominated by a hegemonic ethnic group, and there were so many other smaller ethnic groups fighting for regions of their own. It was the same in every region. It meant that, it meant that we set out in a very competitive mood. The basis for cooperation was there, but it was not properly applied. No political party could win a majority. So every decision taken in Nigeria, every arrangement made had to be based on a coalition. And the coalition we set out with were very interesting. The, the North was the hegemonic group. It had a virtual veto over the two certain states. A veto in the sense of, in the sense that in terms of size, it was virtually three times bigger than the two southern regions. And therefore, it, it meant whoever was going to run Nigeria was going to be 
linking the north and one of the two southern, southern regions. The election that took place in 1959 brought us a government that, in proper terms, was a government of arithmetic. The NCNC and the Action Group, the two southern states, could not work together. The NCNC and the NPC, the Northern People's Congress, had reached an agreement by 1958 as to how they would come together. But they could not, properly speaking, form a government until they had discussed how to share Nigeria. And the, and the decision they reached, I keep saying this, the decision they reached was to give virtually all the big jobs that will be vacated by colonialists to one of the political parties, because in their constituency, that is to say, to say in the Eastern constituency, they had a lot of educated people who could fill the jobs. Did not made the concession. But that was also why Zik, whose party really ought to have produced the prime minister because of the number of seats and votes they got, had conceded that the not will produce the prime minister right. and the leader, the NCNC, will produce a ceremonial president. That changed the chemistry of the Nigerian nation. Well, Odia, uh, hold on a bit. Let's uh, ask. Uh... Senator Sho signing what he thinks about what exactly went wrong, uh, even before independence, as uh, Odia Ofemi is arguing here. Uh, did we really get it wrong, even before independence? Or, you know, Nigeria's uh, uh, problematic, uh, you know, profile is as a result of some other problems after independence? <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Mr. Ruben. The history of Nigeria uh, as an Anglophone colonized nation is not much different from the history of many colonized nations within the African continent. The peculiarity of our own has to do with issues which has happened here and perhaps has not happened in other countries. Uh, 1960 was a date for our flag independence. But we must appreciate the fact, as been uh, stated by the earlier speaker, that what happened in 1960 was uh, a climax of what has been on for a long period of time. But now, the issue of concern is that, yes, we can appreciate the fact that for nearly six decades, we remain as a country. But if we are going to be fair, objective, and realistic with ourselves, uh, the nation that we call Nigeria today is more divided now than it was in 1960. Well, thank you, sir. I'm glad you said that. Earlier, we know that you... Earlier, sir, we know that you tweeted and you said that the dreams of our founding fathers have been shattered by our founding fathers. So could you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, well, uh, the dream of our founding fathers was to have a united, progressive and prosperous nation. As you have seen with our motto, unity and faith, peace and progress. Now, if you pick any of this, whether it is unity, whether it is faith, whether it is peace, whether it is progress, you will see how this country has been destroyed systematically by a succession of leaders that have presided over the affairs of this country. And uh, unfortunately, in the 50s and 60s, the political class, those that aspire for political office, 
If you look at their manifestos and their campaign pledges and promises, it is about light, it is about water, it's about infrastructure. And now, 60 years after, and I believe in the, even the next 20 years, it is still going to be about the same provision of those basic necessities. Each aspect of Nigeria's history you pick, you will see how we have wasted an opportunity, how we have been unable to live up to the dreams of our founding fathers, and how people who have inherited the position of leadership have simply come into public office to serve themselves. It's unfortunate that government after government, we are more interested in building a bridge that crosses River Niger and link the north to the south without noticing that the bridge that exists in the hearts and souls of Nigerians that links them up to each other Hi. has been broken. We have a nation now that is more divided religiously uh, in ethnic uh, uh, and, and sectional issues. We, unfortunately, nobody will see that this is the Nigeria of our dream if he will objectively study how we derailed from 1960 to where we are today. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. It was a missed opportunity. How can we be talking in 2019 still about government need to respect court orders? There should be respect for rule of law. There is a need for us to strengthen our... We are still talking about unity in 2019. So as far as I'm concerned, I can say that... Uh, Nigeria was a missed opportunity, but we still have the chance of doing what we need to do to revert and restore and reset Nigeria back to those founding fathers' dreams that we left and uh, abandoned in the last 60 years. So oh, come back to Lagos and ask our guest here in the studio. So you've heard what uh, Mr. Sani said about the failure over the years of governance. But as you were touching on earlier, don't you? I know that you'd said earlier that, that you believe that the British set Nigeria up to fail. So rather than the issues with Nigeria being Nigerian problems, surely if we look at the root, do you think that our colonial history is the cause of our breakdown in governance today? It would be perfectly correct to say that Britain rigged up Nigeria to fail. Or, better to put it this way, that Britain rigged up Nigeria to remain a colony. And we have managed to be unable to transcend that draw line of keeping Nigeria where they wanted us to be. It, would have, it may have been possible to change the pattern that they laid for us. But we were not allowed, and that word should be emphasized, we were not allowed to think afresh about a mode of self-administration, largely because the groups that had been set up were pushed into a corner. Lugard began by saying, I will form a coalition with a, an ethnic group which will help run the North, and then the North will run Nigeria. He got that pattern from Uganda because the traditional rulership in Uganda meant, required the British to simply govern the people using an old form of formality. When he got to Nigeria, he decided he was going to form this alliance with I mean, it became, for him, a matter of an Anglo-Fulani alliance. And in a 1902 memo to the colonial office, he was very specific. If we, if, if, if we cannot make this generation perform as we will wish them to, we will train their children or we will train their children's children. Before the British came, on so many ethnic groups across Nigeria we are self-governing in a way that had broad constitutional patterns that are not too different from the one that the British were bringing. Within their fold, they had clear ways of taking decisions. The federal system, which many of, of us talk about today, 
were actually in existence in very many of the ethnic groups across Nigeria. The British did not exactly want a return to any of those traditional modes because the, the, those traditional the, 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 modes. Wait, wait a moment. I mean, you know, sometimes this sounds like a conspiracy theory. It is. Yes. The uh, British, they left 59 years ago. We yeah. have had 59 years. We've had successive governments. We've tried military rule, we've tried civilian rule, right? Uh, Senator Sani's point is that, look, we wasted the opportunity that came with independence. I mean, it's not the British governing Nigeria for the past 59 years. Why did why we, have we waste, not been able to make use why of Why did we waste the opportunities? The reason we are not always able to answer that question is because we start, we start from the wrong end of the street. We start by saying we ought by now to have learned how to do it. But that was not the way it began. It began by fixing, by fixing the ground so that you could never make the changes. I give you one good example. The agitation for state creation and for changing the boundaries of the various states began as early as 1904. The Lorin people were already demanding to join the Akit and in the Western region. It never happened. By, 19, by, by 1939, when the Eastern region was, was created, you would have thought that they would consider giving other Nigerians a chance to be self-governing. The British refused. By 1958, when the last conferences for independence were taking place, in order to make sure that states would not be created, the British insisted that all the political parties should agree to postpone Independence Day so that states could be created. No, no, no political party dared to say that independence should be postponed. But when we then became independent, the political parties that won, the political parties that won operated on the basis of, as I said before, the veto of one region over the others. So that each time there was going to be a change in Nigeria, it was either that a riot would take place in, in northern Nigeria or a coup would take place. That is to say, Nigeria always moved as close as possible to the point where a decision would be taken. But when it got to that point, something happened which was terribly drastic. It, you can say that it was the propaganda of arms built up by the, by, by the veto holders that ensured no such decisions would be taken that could change things. And when we are talking about veto holders, let's be very frank with ourselves. The kind of coalition that could have taken place in 1960 was one in which the NCNC, the AG, the NEPU, the, the, uh, the Middlebed Congress would work together. That would have represented every part of the country. But that was not allowed to happen. The British intervened in a way that is now becoming very clear. They actually had to rig the 59 election to make sure they got the kind of answers they want, wanted. Officers, that is to say British officers who were in Nigeria, have started confessing, although many of them were not allowed to do it officially, have started confessing how they were, it was made impossible for Nigeria to calmly decide a change. Nation building is not just an art, it is also a science. And whenever Nigerians reached that point where they could have scientifically determined how to move, it was either that the British intervened or the military intervened. Well, let me ask uh, Senator Sani what he thinks. Senator Sani, uh, Odia Femo here is pushing the, uh, the, the viewpoint that uh, the British uh, gave us independence, yes, in 1960, where that uh, the new country, the independent country, was structured to fail. And he sees that that is the uh, root of our problems, especially as the uh, British uh, promoted uh, the policies of hegemony with advantage uh, given to the uh, northern region over and above other regions in the country. Do you share this view that we should keep blaming the British and uh, overlook uh, whatever happened uh, uh, thereafter as uh, something caused by the British and by the north? By the military. And by the military, yes. Um, well, we, it is natural for a colonial power when it is retreating to set a design 
that will appease or address its own interest even after it has left. So it is not uh, peculiar to Nigeria, but if you look at the uh, such histories in, of other countries, you will still see whether it is Portugal, Spain, or France, uh, whenever they are pulling out, they will naturally leave uh, structures and institutions and certain configurations that will make it possible for them to continue to exercise influence or make it impossible for a new nation to go beyond their own dreams. But uh, it's been 60 years since they have left. Uh, we have every opportunity to reconfigure our country in the shape of our own interests and the interests of our children and of our future. And we have failed to do that. Governments after governments, they come in and go, and uh, the fundamental issues of nation building and issues of restructuring are still things they consider a taboo. Uh, what is of interest when most people come into government is how they can enrich themselves and appease their ethnic, uh, religious uh, groupings, affiliations, and identities. And at the end of the day, one thing or another happen, and then we are into another tunnel. So uh, we can blame the British. Naturally, a colonial power is not here for generosity, and it's not also here to help us. They are here for themselves. But having been able to leave in 1960, uh, we could have, with the governments we are having, both elected and unelected, an opportunity to reset our country, which we have failed to do. Uh, if you look at education, or health, or infrastructure, those are issues that we could have addressed on our own. So even things that we are at liberty and have the opportunity to address, we were not able to do them. So I, I agree with him, but we should also share the bulk of the blame now. Uh, 60 years is not 60 days. We have been through periods of civil war, of coup, of civil strifes, and then for all those periods, we refuse to learn geography even after an earthquake. So when I make it clear that the new colonial powers, which are our own countrymen in position of power, I uh, don't see themselves as leaders that come to serve. People see themselves as leaders who have conquered, rulers who have conquered a territory, and as such, they have, to, they have to impose themselves and do as they wish. The 1999 was an opportunity for us to rebuild our country in the shape of our dreams. It's been 20 years of democracy. But if you look at it, all those issues which we fear under the military, are still prevalent with us. So we don't need the British to, to, to rebuild schools, to build hospitals, to address the yearnings of our people. We, the British are not there. These are issues we can do. But even as simple as securing even our country with our own security apparatus is even a problem to us. So uh, the bulk of the problem now lies with us. We can't continue to blame the colonial master, but we can't and now shy away from the fact that they have laid a foundation and a landmine which kept exploding. But we have an opportunity to detonate it and also to bring an end to it, but which we have failed. This is where I think we're missing each other because while uh, Mr. Se the, the senator does agree that colonial influence has played a huge role in the state of Nigeria today, he seems adamant that governance individually, our leaders, have played a role in that too. But I, I want to put the question to the senator. That includes you, yourself, as a former lawmaker. So what have you done with your power and your influence to improve the state of Nigeria? It's all good to point fingers at everybody else, but the time that you served this country, what did you do? And notably, what, what, what difference did you make? On the Senate, which uh, naturally, if you ask me, I will tell you things that I have done. But we are talking about Nigeria. 
And uh, we must accept the fact that each and every one of us have a role to play. Even you as a journalist, uh, you are not different from the situation which we have found ourselves, promoting uh, some certain agendas of individuals or the groupings. I mean, to change the governance of this country, we are different. So we all actually. have our own. Yes. You, of course, you are also part of it uh, to change the, the governance of this country. You cannot remove the media from it. So as far as what I'm trying to say, make it clear is that when I say governance, people in the position of power have failed. I have not uh, excluded myself, but being a four-year senator, certainly there is a limit to what I could have been able to do. But I have been able to do my own best, even if my best is still not enough. But on the, in the general sense, uh, Nigeria uh, is in where it is today, not because simply the British has uh, laid a landmine, but the leaders and uh, successive governments have failed. People have looted in billions of dollars and have enriched themselves. Governments after government are not interested in restructuring Nigeria and putting us on the right footing. And then we now find ourselves, after elections, we are still talking of the next election. How can a nation rebuild itself with this kind of perpetuity in electoral politics? So I, uh, I support what he said, but I also give the bulk of the blame to us, that because the opportunities are there for us to do what we need to do. Well, let, me, let me come back to you. Now... We all know that there are issues that need to be addressed, issues about nationhood, issues about governance and accountability and all of that. Now, what do you think we can do to move Nigeria forward? During the last elections, the APC was talking about moving Nigeria to the next level. And I guess, yes, every Nigeria wants Nigeria to move to the next level. Uh, Senator Sani has been talking about the need for restructuring. What do you think we can do to have a better Nigeria? And, you know, we don't need to keep worrying about the British. How do we save this country that belongs to all of us? I would want to say that the real issue is that we have not properly confronted the problems that Britain created for Nigeria. And it is because we have not confronted those problems and the answers we have been, we have been, provided, we have been providing are not consensually brought to the level of decision-making that we have the problem we have. From the very beginning, the restructuring of Nigeria was meant to keep us in a certain state. Each time we have tried to make that change, to change that structure, something was done that disrupted the process. I, what I started by saying is this, that whenever we try to change things, if Britain did not intervene, the military intervened. And the kind of intervention they have made ensure that the power structure that was, that was placed, that was put in place, is never changed. We still have a veto holder in the Nigerian political system. Yes. Well, you, but wait, you said, I'm coming. I mean, what do we do the, about all these problems we claim the British Everybody created. says, and it has been so from the very beginning, the idea of restructuring Nigeria has been there, as I said, since 1904. The truth is this. I happen to take the position that only one of the political leaders took. I have, been, I, I, I have to be very honest that I am very partisan on this issue, and my partisanship is based on this. The first thing was we had so many different ethnic groups. It was possible for each of them on their own to be self-governing. We and have, the only we have 400 ethnic nationalities. Oh, yes. It is possible for each of them to be self-governing. And the solution provided by those who believed in this process is that it could only be done through a, f a federalization of the Nigerian state. Federalism was initially done in a unitary fashion, but gradually Nigerians pared it down. And this, this was the way it worked out. Every ethnic nationality that cannot govern itself because it, is, it, it does not have the resources agreed 
to pool resources with other smaller ethnic groups. So it was possible from the very beginning to put all Nigerians together. And this was the solution provided. One was this, that in order to turn Nigeria into a proper nation, all the knowledge in the English language should be transferred into the indigenous languages. And all the knowledge in the indigenous languages should be transferred into English. Equalize your relationship with your colonizer. And you can compete with them and compete with each other in a, in a manner that ensures we take serious decisions about how we will govern ourselves. But beyond that was this, that the regions that needed to be created we are also well known from the very beginning. It was not only the three regions. All those who were, who were, who were campaigning for gov self governorship in the north, in the east, and the, in the west, were largely prevented from doing so. Even when we then decided to create the regions, we ensured that the states would not have the means to govern themselves properly. That is to say, by the time the Civil War forced us to get to that point, we still refused to take the right decision. Why? Because by 1959-1960, the division of the Nigerian state began with one, all the military installations going to one region, all the railway extensions going to one region, the Kanji Dam going to one region, the iron and steel industry going to one region, because of that share out that I spoke of at the beginning. Because all the big jobs, the big railway men were we are from the east. The, 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 the big directors, we are, we are from the east. Even in the military, the, the, the officer corps was commanded by the east. It is usually described as a state. I mean, in a, in a, there was a country. Chidon Achebe talks very approvingly of the domination of the east at that time. But that is actually the point. Although they had all the big officers in these organizations, the ground on which all of them functioned lay where the veto holder was. And that veto holder managed to have enough soldiers to keep, to keep a, propo a propaganda of arms in place that made it impossible for any changes to take place. Even if you had a conference today, there is bound to be a veto holder input that we change it. How to change it has been the central issue of Nigeria. How do you restructure in the face of a veto holder who would always intervene to make sure that you don't get a change? Is it really true to say that, you know, the uh, uh, northern part of the country uh, exercises a veto power over the rest of Nigeria? I can Today. explain it. Today, in, oh, in, in 2019. In 2019, in 2019, it has been reduced to a very bare fist issue. You have a president who can say who can say that all the international agencies dealing with Nigeria should move more positive issues to the north. That is to say, Gen uh, General Buhari, the World Bank has confessed it in the open that they are required to move things to the north. The, the structure of government as it exists has been so banalized that nepotism is almost written into the Nigerian constitution in a manner that almost all other uh, state functionaries are obliged to assume that that is the way to run a government. If, 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 that, is not, if that is not a way of turning the veto holder into an almost divine, uh, into having a divine right to make things happen their way. There's no other, other way of explaining it. It just so happens that what was a mere veto holder yesterday has become a divine, a, a divine push. And let but, me tell you what is more terrible about that divine there push. There are Southerners who have been exercising veto oh, power I will in the course of Nigerian I history. I will explain so this. So it's not as if it's no, only no, in the north. No, no, no. no. I, will have, uh, I will explain this. The, av the average educated Nigerian, in order to be shown as a liberal, very uh, freedom-loving, democratic person, is always trying to be nice to the north. There is no reason to be nice to the north. They are our brothers, and we have a right to fight over the issues that we need to change. It is, no, it is no longer right to be nice to the North. 
Because in this particular case, I give you a very, a very good example now. You have a governor who tells you that all the known full and all the known Nigerian full and is must be catered for by the Nigerian state, and actually argues it, argues against the, the respect for international boundaries, argues against national policies on the ground that one ethnic group, which just happened to be the ethnic group with which the British worked out an alliance, should permanently remain a freeholder moving across all boundaries, respecting no laws and things of that nature. If you are talking about if you are talking about all Nigerians having a right, that is a claim to a divine right that you are not allowed to touch unless you belong to that ethnic fraction in Nigeria. If that ethnic fraction had the means to create a nation, they would have created one by now. Be the truth is that between the Fulani and the Hausa, there is a very badly structured sense of nationality. The, 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 way, the way people talk about it, those who know, they will say a pulo is a pulo and a kado is a kado. It means that although they speak the same language, they have not managed to create a sense of nationality. And they have imposed that in every other part of Nigeria and in every Nigerian conference and situation. We just don't need, I mean, we don't, we don't have to be over liberal. Let us confront the issues. When you allow a small minority to control a majority, as I once said on this, on, on, in this station, they can only rule by falsehood and violence. Well, and that is what well, we are let, having. Let's get uh, Senator Shosani's views on uh, what you have just said, although we understand that the uh, Independence Day parade is about to uh, uh, begin in Abuja. But once we get the uh, uh, footage of that uh, ceremony, uh, we'll be bringing that to our viewers. OK, there it is live on the screen. They are getting ready for the parade, uh, which is expected to begin in the coming hours, uh, where the president will obviously be taking to the stage well, and addressing the it, crowd. It looks like this is a parade by the Brigade of Guards yes. uh, within the uh, premises of the uh, presidential villa. So it's uh, a low-key uh, you know, celebration. That's what it means, nothing elaborate. Yes, but uh, Senator Shirusani, um, I'd asked you before uh, we showed uh, that uh, parade that's about to begin in the presidential villa. Uh, what do you think of this persistent argument by, uh, by uh, Odia of Hemo, that we don't have to be nice to the north? Because what we have is the Aousa Fulani uh, seizing power in Nigeria and dictating to every other group within the federation. And that unless we address the issue of the Aousa Fulani hegemony, we may not be able to make any progress. <clears throat> mm, um, thank you again. Well, I carefully listened to his own submission. And I can understand from the point he was coming from. And then I can also say that... Uh, uh, Looking at things from his own perspective has to do with uh, the analysis of history uh, as a former action group uh, stalwart. I, I can believe that he, he has uh, had his own argument. But from my own side, uh, even coming from the north, uh, I think there should be a clear distinction when it comes to the north you are talking about, uh, if actually uh, those resources, power, and whatever that goes to the north actually goes to the people of the north, we could have been far ahead than where we are now. We are far behind the south uh, in areas of industry, in areas of infrastructure, in areas of education, and in so many areas. So uh, it is, from my point of view, the political elites in the north, in collaboration with their own counterparts in the southwest, southeast, and the south south, that are holding Nigeria hostage. As far as the Talakawas in the north are concerned, they have not benefited from much from the Nigerian project. And whatever is being uh, 
sort of line up and said that this is for the north, this has gone to the north, the north has been dominating this and that. It has not demonstrated that in the lives of the people of northern Nigeria. So it's also wrong for anyone to shield the political elite within his own tribal and ethnic group who are also part and parcel of the problems of Nigeria in order for him to generalize that the North has been a beneficiary of the Nigerian project. There are uh, people uh, also in the southern part of Nigeria, the political elites are as, in the South are as vicious as those in the North. Uh, they benefited, they benefit from the Nigerian project. They are in government, they are in business, they are a part of the exploiting, uh, plundering political class. So I uh, actually don't agree with him. But we must also say the fact that um, if we are desirous of keeping this country, there is a need for us to constantly and consistently remind ourselves from where we come from. Uh, we can't have a nation when one part of the country felt that, one elite from one part of the country felt that it is their own right to continue to dominate the political scene forever. And also it's not right for Nigeria to think that a certain ethnic group or a certain section of the country are not destined to rule. So these are all issues that we could have all sit down and address as a country, but we continuously and consistently uh, shy away from it. Now, take for example, if you see the way the budget is being uh, run uh, for many years, uh, we all have our representations in the National Assembly. Uh, what makes someone from your own part of the country being able to stand up and defend himself, def defend his own people, and also present issues that are germane to his own people. But um, unfortunately, like uh, in other countries, when they say we have political parties, uh, left of the right, left of the center, right of the center, or communist, uh, socialist, or conservative, or labor parties, in Nigeria, the political parties are more differentiated from each other by their names. And when people go to register in INEC, they look at the alphabet that will put them on the top of the ballot paper, which is normally A. So when people are elected into office, they are there more for the person who sponsored them to be there than the interests of their people for them to defend and protect. So uh, there is an abundant opportunity for Nigeria to rebuild and reset itself. But like I've said, it has failed. Uh, it is wrong for anybody to think that every person who comes from one part of the country is an exploiter, and any person who comes from another part of the country is exploited. And it is possible to see even uh, the problems you have are the problems who are presiding, uh, problems of elites within your own uh, area or constituency. Take, for example, the, the country decided that 13% derivation should be uh, channel to Niger Delta. Can you sincerely see that that huge amount of money has been used for the betterment of the lives of people of Niger Delta? Look at the NDDC that was created. It has over two trillion naira debt, and this revelation was made by the new minister of of Niger Delta, uh, Godswill Apabio. See how. Even the opportunity, the resources that you even control, you cannot even use it to better the lives of your people. And I can say it. Go to Jigawa and see. Go to Gombe State and see. The level of infrastructure with the little amount of money they are able to get from the federal, for the Federation account. They are able to build infrastructure in Gombe, in Jigawa State. But go to any of these Niger Delta states. The issues have always been that we are waterlogged, and we don't need to. And, and then see how the political class, the governors, have enriched themselves by being in position of office and have access to resources. So uh, it is wrong for anybody. And I believe that the, my friend Odia come from a state where also similar issues were raised about governance, uh, like me, that would be said to have lost an election. But I also see that 
uh, ODA has also tried to contest elections, but they could not allow him to, to be. So it also has to do with our own issues. From the north, I can say that the poor people, uh, the poor people that constitute the mass of the people of northern Nigeria, have not benefited, but have been able to be, uh, share the blanket blame of being part of the problems of Nigeria. So I think it's also important that uh, speakers should also look within their own houses, their own compounds, their own community, their own towns, and see local oppressors and tyrants who have also stagnated and stifled development of their people. Uh, as far as the North is concerned, the House and of Fulani is dominant. But I don't think that we have actually benefited from all that has been alleged to have come from the northern part of Nigeria. Well, I, I think that's a fair response, you know, uh, to Odia's position. Or you have anything to add? It I is think not a fair response. I, no, I think it's a fair response. No, it is not a fair response. To say that what we have is an elite problem no. or a class problem. How do you define an elite? No, he's Nigerians, saying that Nigerians the, the, refuse to the define elite, elite, elite in, the north, in collusion with the elite in the south nope. and other parts. No, nope. are the Nigeria, ones behind Nigeria the is a not very, ordinary man. Nigeria is a very leader-centered society. It means that whoever is at the center in control over determines what happens all around. People make undue concessions to them, and they determine what kind of behavior will be permissible within the system. In the in, in the case of in the case of Nigeria, I want to give you how the ideas we hold affect those policies. Look, there was a quarrel between the Marxists in the South and the Marxists in the North. And you know what the Marxists in the North did? They, they refused, they rejected the, the Karl Marxist position of a workers' revolution. And you know why? They said because, you see, there are more workers in the South. Be careful with the word revolution. Wait. We there are, we say, problems say, recently. There are more workers in the South than in the, in the North. So if you have a workers' revolution, it will be a Southern Nigerian revolution. So they opted for a peasant revolution because there are more peasants in the North than the South. So that even at the level of such ideological purity, the North-South divide was there. What I am saying is actually not a North-South divide. Okay. I have just one thing to point out properly. Do you know that the, the Bagi of Nigeria, the Gwari, they are divided between six different states and have never been allowed to come together to form a state, whereas they are contiguous? But I'll tell you something. When you now have a governor, in fact, two governors, Bauchi and, uh, and Kebi, when you now have two governors insisting that an ethnic group that does not even belong to Nigeria should be given special rights in Nigeria, and you find that those who are already in Nigeria, like the Gwari and many other ethnic groups, I will come to that, they are not even allowed to come together as an ethnic group. You will know that the source of the crisis is very strong. But because I would like of the us control. To, move on to another subject. Yes. Because, you know, I asked you originally, what can we do to move Nigeria truly to the next level? Now, one major area of strength that, uh, you know, even outsiders have uh, uh, recognized. President Trump even alluded to it in his uh, letter of congratulation to the Nigerian government, is the fact that Nigerians are talented, they are creative, they are competitive, they have skills. We have a crop of Nigerians who are excelling all over the world. Now, how do we reorganize the education sector in such a way that this potential does not go down in the face of challenges of security, challenges of governance, and lack of accountability. I hope we know that when we are talking about Nigerians being talented, it should be credited to the struggle for free education in Nigeria. It created the basis for the competition that has made it possible for all parts of Nigeria to wish to have a grand input into expansion of education. So it did, it did not fall from heaven. It was created here. We are not different from Ghanaians or Burkina Faso people. People created a circumstance that made it possible for education to grow here. Now, the issue was, why was that possible? It was possible because we had created a federal system in which some people sat down and decided that we, on our own, as a self-governing people, would ensure that every child born to a man or woman in this region who have an education. Other regions that could not do, 
governmentally formalized such a system, had to find ways. Every village, every village in the East created unions that would pull money together to send their child to, where, to wherever education was possible. Now, that competitive spirit is precisely what has been smashed or what is being smashed by what I call the veto, the veto holding position in Nigerian politics. Because it is that veto uh, holding position which destroyed the, the individual creativity that you had amongst various communities. It is the smashing of that spirit that has led to corruption, that has created the disaffection that you had between various Nigerians. Remove it, and you will find that Nigerians are not just brilliant. They also have a capacity for building cooperative ventures. And that, in fact, all the cooperation you have had in Nigeria today is because we managed at that beginning to have individuals who could quarrel between themselves, but had a very objective basis for defining what progress means. Now, don't let us forget that in the North, that veto holding position ensured that nothing spread out beyond where they are. I, I like the way the way Sheryl Sani tried to shift it into a north-south between me and him. Nope. It has nothing to do with a north-south element or factor. It is simply that in the north, the basis for individual creativity among communities was smashed by veto holding. And because it and because it succeeded in the north, and the north had been made so large by Lugar deliberately, deliberately, and I don't want us to forget that, because all those all those uh, parts of like Benway, which were parts of the east, were removed and made part of the north. They want the the British in the north wanted to create a bastion that could not be shaken by the noisemakers in Lagos, and because they managed to create that bastion. They ensured that whenever a policy was on the way which could benefit everybody, they stopped it. They stymied everything that would not lead in the direction that they had predetermined. So let's face it, what is wrong with Nigeria can be dealt with through restructuring. But that restructuring, as I said, must begin, remember where I started. Let all the knowledge in the English language be put into every indigenous language. And let all the knowledges in the in indigenous languages be transferred to the English language. Equalize your relationship with the rest of the world. And I can tell you, we can build a Nigeria where this is possible. They say we have about 15 million out of school children. How come no government has come out with a policy that within four years can wipe it out? Well, it is possible. Uh, uh, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. If we were to talk, let's... Let's, let's settle on this, the issue of education at the grassroots level. Ultimately, a country is only as strong as the people therein. And as we move forward, new generations of people will be leading this country. If we look at grassroots levels of education, do we think it's at the state level, I mean, all government schools, do we think they're doing well enough to facilitate the growth of the next generation of Nigerians? I know that last week we talked about Kaduna's governor, is it Nasir El Rufai, who has his son enrolled in a, in a, in a government school. I, is, is that a good thing? Is that a step in the right direction? It is very annoying for me to discuss El Rufai and his state, because El Rufai is a Nigerian educated with Nigerian money in a way that ought to make him a permanent supporter of public education. What he, is, what he has just done is a public relations stunt that only people who are not genuinely interested in educational expansion Mr. get Son themselves Mr. involved. Mr. Sonny, do you agree with that? No, let me finish before no. you ask him. Because, you see, <laughs> in Kaduna State, in Kaduna State, in Kaduna State, when they started this free education thing, Thing. You could have 150 children in a class. Look, I grew up as a free education child. I went to free education at the age of four. I was not qualified to enter. After two years, I was sent home, and I had to come back again when I was six. I can assure you, Jack Conde is the, is the finest proof, because he's where there is the media. Every, 
there was a three, a three shift system in Lagos. He transformed it to one shift. He made sure that every child, pe people, people from states where there was no free education, brought their children here. He gave them, he gave them education, and every class, every class, had the right number of school children. When you go to many of these states that say they are doing free education and are using their children for adverts, the schools they say they are building, it's annoying to start with. But that's not the point. The point is that the number of children they are keeping out of the school system makes it very annoying. When you see the big jeep that the governor rides, you ought to go to some of these schools and ask yourself, shouldn't we sell the governor's jeep so that we can build them proper schools? The truth is this. There is no education taking place in many of these states. When they still talk about free, when they talk about education, they think they are doing people a favor. That is the core issue in every state building. What they are building is not a free education system. It's not a public education system. They give poor education to poor people's children in order to keep them poor and subservient to their own class. No. We should be open-eyed enough to say that they are not building an educational system. They are building a wire for the next election. Well, I think at this point it's appropriate to uh, invite uh, Senator Shul Sani back and ask you, uh, Senator Sani, what do you think? Do you really think that, uh, you know, Northern governors, uh, like your own governor, you are from Kaduna State, you know, you are, are just busy doing publicity stunts all over the place, despite the fact that the uh, North has the largest number of active school children and, uh, you know, school dropouts, and yet, leaders of the North have been discussing education for, you know, uh, northern children since 1959. And yet, uh, we still have all of these uh, challenges in terms of school enrollment. Um, well, if you go through the profile of almost 98% of persons holding position of authority in Nigeria today, particularly those from the North, were products of primary, uh, public schools from primary, secondary, and even tertiary levels. And um, as someone who was born in Kaduna, lived in Kaduna all my life, and I'm still there, except when, at the time when I served as a senator, then I temporarily moved here. Uh, I don't need anybody to uh, lecture me on what public school is all about. But I think what the governor did was simply to appeal to an audience outside of Kaduna to see himself as a certain pioneer or someone setting a face for something. But it was simply a deception. First and foremost, I can tell you that for anybody who lives in Kaduna knows very well that uh, what the state of public schools are in that uh, city so taking a six-year-old boys with 35 television crew and social media influencers, you should be able to know what he intends to achieve. And also taking one of your children out of so many who are others are in private schools. And also you can see what that person is all trying to achieve. Also renovating one school with 195 million naira and then taking your child there with television, with security, with everything. I think what you journalists need to do is to go back to that school for the next uh, two, three, four months, whether, or oh, four years, whether you continuously see that boy in that uh, school. Uh, so I know people will say that this is uh, part of my political difference with him, but all you need to do is to come, come to Kaduna and ask the people of Kaduna to take you around to see the state of uh, public school. Uh, just before this, before from the government house to the school he took his child, there were more than six to seven primary schools which he has jumped in order to go to the one which he has innovated to invite some of you to go there and cover for people in Lagos and other places to see. So that is simply a showman. He has been used to that. The last few a month, he took television cameras to flash him. He was chasing kidnappers along Kaduna Abuja Road. So it's all part of his own uh, idea of selling himself for, for the so-called 2023. But he has the right to do that. 
But having said that, we are not serious about education in the northern part of Nigeria. Uh, because if we look at the bulk of the problem we face in the north today, can be directly or indirectly attributed to the collapse of education in northern part of Nigeria. Most of the people who are holding position of power today have their children studying in the United States, in uh, Canada, Europe, and other Asian countries. And uh, the, something I want you to observe is that you, you, you will find them that the children were enrolled when they were in public office and not before then. And many of them could not afford to take their children to study outside of Nigeria until when they come into position of authority. So uh, as far as we're concerned, we talk so much. Northern governors meet in Kaduna almost quarterly. They meet for an hour or two and come out with community and everybody disperses. And the problem is still there. The number of out-of-school children, the bulk of them, are from northern part of Nigeria. There wasn't, there is still not any concerted and serious effort aimed at addressing this problem. You can see the problems we are facing in the northwest, the banditry, the kidnapping, the killings, and the mayhem. And in the northeastern part of Nigeria, you can see the insurgency and how it has lingered on for 10 years. If we have fixed our education right, even if this problem has reached to where it is today, it couldn't have been with such intensity, but it could, not have, it could have been addressed earlier. You can hardly find a person who is well-educated and uh, has opportunities of life, him picking up a gun, gun to kidnap uh, people and also impose fines, because now they have even gone beyond Kidnapping people Mr. Sunny, if I could interrupt you and just ask you a very people. important question. You, you've touched on it already, actually, and that is the issue with security. And ultimately, we know what's happening with Chibok and the missing girls that are still haven't all been returned home. How, tell us more about your thoughts about security, the state of security in Nigeria, very, very briefly. I think the, the most important challenge to uh, Nigeria's security system is what is happening in the northwest and the northeastern part of Nigeria. Uh, in the northwest, um, the bandits have become an authority unto themselves. Uh, having reached a truce with Zamfara state government, they have moved down to Kaduna and Niger state. Most northern part of Niger, with the borders of Kaduna, is now under the siege of kidnappers, including parts of Birningwari in Kaduna State. And Kaduna State, local governments are also under siege. It has reached a point that governors mm, have to you. come down from... Thank you, uh, Senator Sani. ...and sit down and negotiate with bandits. Thank you, Senator Sani. Um, we'll have to uh, close this conversation at this point. Um, we've enjoyed very much uh, your inputs. Uh, Odia Ofemo, thank you very much, and thank you for always obliging us.